Welcome. Uh, if you're just joining us for the ad webinar series, you're in the right place. We are super excited for you to be here for our last episode of the season, but we know it's going to be a great one. Uh, we're going to start with a warm up activity, uh, and the theme is comfort zones. So we know this year personally has pushed us past our comfort zones in many different ways. And we're wondering if you can think of a time in which you have pushed past your comfort zone as a teacher. So what happened? How did it go? Please let us know in the chat. And also please feel free to say hi to each other. We wanna keep this webinar as engaging as possible and try to make it a two-way conversation uh, with you and also to include your voices as well. So do please uh, chat with each other. Uh, and right now we're talking about the topic of comfort zones. So can you think of a time that you have pushed past your comfort zone as a teacher? What happened and how did it go? So we're just gonna uh, share our responses in the chat for right now. And if you're just joining us, welcome to the Teaching with Tinkercad webinar series. So if that's what you're looking for, you're in the right place and we're excited that you're here. So we're gonna get started with the formal program in about a minute. But before we do that, we're just warming it up in the chat. So please feel free to say hi, introduce yourselves and let us know, can you think of a time you have pushed past your comfort zone as a teacher? What happened and how did it go? How's it going in the chat, Jenny? It's going fine. So far we have teaching virtually with robots. Wow. Um, yeah, 3D printing was a leap for me. Now fixing my printer is another leap. <laughs> many <laughs> leaps. Oh, go ahead. No, there's many leaps in 3D design and printing. <laughs> I uh, taught drone coding, even though I had never done that before. So cool. Yeah, teaching virtually, teaching robotics virtually. Very interested to hear about that. And we're actually gonna be talking about circuits and how you can simulate uh, circuits digitally uh, tonight as well. So um, hoping, hoping that this might actually help you in the future and uh, teaching robotics virtually too. So again, we're gonna get started uh, with the formal program, probably in about 30 seconds or so, but for now we're just warming it up in the chat. So please feel free to say hi to each other and also uh, let us know, can, can you think of a time that you have pushed past your comfort zone as a teacher? What happened and how did it go? We hope it went well. Sometimes it's really unnerving when you uh, feel like you're in a place that you're pushing yourself beyond your comfort zone, but sometimes it's a happy surprise in the end. We have a couple more comments. Um, having the students use a CNC machine and ended up working well and the kids love making projects for it. Nice. Um, I was tasked with teaching 3D printing when I had no idea how to use them. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Sometimes that's like even more fun because you're learning along with your students as well. And sometimes they surprise you with their prior knowledge and skills that maybe are more advanced than yours. <laughs> We have teaching STEM with a curriculum I just created over the summer with sixth graders. This year has been challenging, lots of modifying. Mm -hmm. Lots of adapting, I'm sure, too. Yep. All right, so please keep it going in the chat. Please uh, chat with us, chat with each other. Uh, in the future, I'm going to be asking, I'm going to be pushing out more questions just to kind of keep the conversation going. I know teachers are really great at following instructions. So uh, for Jenny's sake, when we push out some of these questions later, if you could put them very counterintuitively in the question and answer, it will actually help her be able to find your responses so that we can share your voices. But we're gonna get started with the formal program. So again, welcome to the Teaching with Tinkercad webinar series. This is episode five. Have no fear if this is your first episode. I, I'm gonna share some information with you later so you can catch up, maybe do a binge watch over the weekend. Uh, but for tonight, uh, we're gonna be talking about getting creative with circuits. And we have a stellar episode for our last episode of this season. So before we begin, I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Kellyanne Mahoney, and I'm a youth program specialist at Autodesk. I am actually a national board certified teacher. I was a teacher in the Boston Public Schools for 13 years prior to joining Autodesk. I also wanted to introduce uh, my friend and colleague, Jenny Fennell. Uh, Jenny, you wanna say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. Nice to be here. I'm the content yeah. development manager for youth education at Autodesk. 
So throughout the night, uh, Jenny is going to help bring your voice into this episode so we can keep this as discursive and engaging as possible. Uh, also, even though this is our last episode, we would love for you to still stay in touch with us. Um, so please reach out to us via the Autodesk Twitter or Instagram. Uh, you could also tag at Tinkercad or at Instructables. You can use the hashtags TinkerTogether or hashtag make anything. And we're actually going to be introducing an exciting new uh, hashtag tonight, thanks to one of our guests. Uh, so keep your eyes peeled for that one. It's going to be fun. I'm also really excited tonight for our guests. I, when we were rehearsing for this episode, I felt like I was like within like the, the Avengers of makers. Uh, so one, one of those guests is Becky Stern. She's the community manager for Instructable. She's a maker educator and maker extraordinaire. And she's gonna be talking tonight about uh, teaching with Arduino within Tinkercad. Uh, so you can reach out to Becky also and connect with her via Twitter and Instagram. We also will be hearing from Dory Friedman, uh, who is another amazing maker who's so innovative and creative. Uh, she's the maker and innovative innovation coordinator uh, at St. Matthew's Parish School in Pacific Palisades, California. Uh, and you can uh, connect with her via Twitter and Instagram. You can see her handle there. Uh, so we are so excited uh, for Dory tonight. And she's gonna talk about microbit within Tinkercad. Last but not least, I just want you to know that if you have questions throughout the episode, you are supported by the youth education team for Autodesk, so Instructables and Tinkercad. Uh, so do please chat with us and do please stick around for the end. So we, uh, we're going to have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, so do please stick around for that. We do have goals for this evening. One of our goals is to inspire students to improvise and engineer solutions to authentic problems while learning how software and hardware work together. We also hope to help you demystify electronics for your students by designing opportunities for them to play with wires, microcontrollers, LEDs, and sensors, both virtually and in real life. And again, you can throughout the episode, ask questions to the Tinkercad team and we're here for you at the end too, if you want to ask questions then. So the roadmap for this evening is we're gonna begin with some general knowledge about Tinkercad. I'm gonna share with you an instruction, instructional resource that you can use, particularly if you're just getting started with Tinkercad. Uh, we're gonna be hearing both from Dory and from Becky about how they have empowered student voice through teaching circuits. Uh, and also they're gonna share demonstrations. So again, we're gonna get a demonstration in uh, Microbit and also a demonstration in Arduino. And then last but not least is the question and answer. So just to begin with some general knowledge, particularly if you're just joining us this evening, welcome. So Tinkercad is a fun uh, environment for your students to create and design things. They can design small things like a car. You know, if you have a 3D printer, they could also even think about how they could make the, the car move, for example. They could think big, so they could think architecturally and design big you know, structural spaces. And then you can sneak in that math about measurements and ratios and proportions. They can also design computationally. As you can see here, this, uh, this bridge that's being designed using Tinkercad code blocks. And last but not least, your students, by using Tinkercad, by using Tinkercad can see themselves in STEM. Uh, and I think that that's one of the really the funnest things about Tinkercad. I was actually, I used to be an English teacher before I joined Autodesk. And I always really love to infuse the arts into STEM and put the A in STEAM. So uh, who is Autodesk? So we make software for people who make things. So if you've ever driven a high performance vehicle or thought about buying an electric car or stood in awe at the beauty of a skyscraper, or marveled at the infrastructure of a bridge or the computer graphics in a blockbuster film or a video game, chances are you've engaged with something one of our customers have made. And one of the reasons that we're telling you this is because Tinkercad, which we're gonna be featuring tonight, is free for everyone and it's online, um, but also you'll be uh, getting this slideshow later on with a link to this web page where you can learn about how educators and students can access about 100 of our professional tools for free. 
But the place to start is Tinkercad, whether you're advanced or whether you're uh, just getting started. It's a place for prototyping and imagining. Um, and really, it's just a creativity tool to, to fuel your imagination. Tinkercad works really well on Chromebooks. It also works on iPads. And the fun uh, bonus feature on the iPad app is you can actually unleash your design into the real world using augmented reality, as you can see here. So there are three environments within Tinkercad. There's the 3D editor, there's the circuits or electronics editor, and there's also the code blocks editor. So the Tinkercad is all three environments. If you use them together or use them separately, it's an invention space also for students. Tonight, I'm gonna to be sharing with you a really great resource in the form of a lesson plan uh, from the Smithsonian, our friends at the Smithsonian Spark Lab, where they are helping students think about how they could make an invention using virtual components in Tinkercad. But each of their lessons also takes guide students through a process to help them think about how they can be an inventor and how they can apply that to different projects. And in being an inventor, you are imagining and you're imagining and then you're, you're uh, developing a prototype. And when we hear the word prototype, sometimes we think of like this like fancy word, but really all a prototype is is a vehicle for communicating your idea to others. So it could start in a, as a sketch on paper or a sketch on a napkin, you know, with your friends, um, you know, over lunch, telling them about your idea. It's just a way of communicating your idea to the world. So you could do that through, you know, craft materials, like you can see the student doing at uh, the Spark Lab uh, in, at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., or you could do it digitally with virtual components. So there are different uh, environments in Tinkercad that you can explore the prototype, prototyping process with. So there's the 3D editor where you're just dragging shapes out onto the work plane, combining the shapes to make new interesting shapes, subtracting from those shapes to add complexity to them. And it's a great place to actually start building a looks like prototype, which you can see this teacher, uh, Melissa Culver, uh, tweeting about recently. She said sketches are brain brainstorming tools in engineering. What if we sent Dash, their robot, to Mars to take video pictures for NASA and Perseverance? A cell phone attachment may help us equip, equip Dash to do just that. And you can see she had her students quickly uh, create a prototype that looks like what the object is that they want to uh, design. You might also think about like another. So when you're using, when you're making a prototype, you're finding a, a unique way to solve a problem. And oftentimes when you come up with an idea that, you know, it, no one has ever thought about before and you're being really inventive, it's, it's kind of hard to communicate. And sometimes it requires some storytelling, which you could do in Tinkercad, as you can see here. This is an example of solving the problem of seawalls. So sometimes, you know, a seawall, although it blocks the ocean, you know, and protects our infrastructure, it also sometimes blocks the beautiful views of the ocean. So this is an example actually from Princeton, New Jersey, and you can see actually how it works here. So imagine you had a seawall that was modular and flex flexible. And you know, on sunny days, it could act as an umbrella. And then on days where there's storms, it could kind of bend down. But it's hard to explain that without a visual. So another environment within Tinkercad that you could use for prototyping is the code blocks environment, which allows you to design with draggable blocks of code. Uh, and maybe when you're starting to think more deeply, about your prototype, you want to think about how you might make it work. And maybe that might require smaller, more precise parts, like you could see in this gear design here. Uh, and when you design a gear in code blocks, you can kind of keep that code in your pocket, maybe even bring it into the 3D design editor. Uh, and maybe you need a, a, a you need a gear with more teeth or fewer teeth. You can quickly change that using variables in code blocks. So this gets into thinking about a works like prototype where you're not thinking as much about the aesthetics of what you're designing, but just really showing someone how it might work. And this is an awesome example from an instructable uh, by another educator, MC Langer. Uh, so this is his awesome Tinkercad Robotics for High School Walking Warhammer. There's a link to this in the slideshow, and I encourage you to take it uh, to check it out. It is very thorough. So lastly, the environment that we're focusing on tonight is the electronics or circuits environment where you can program, simulate, and assemble. 
but it's also still it's a playful space where students can iterate on their ideas and test them out virtually and not burn out their parts in real life but burn them out digitally which is a lot more affordable for teachers and this gets into thinking about how you could make a design for manufacture prototype so not just like how it works but really thinking about the how you're going to make it work so thinking about the components that you might uh, you might need in order to power your invention, so be it a motor or a sensor. As you can see here, this is another educator, uh, Sandeep Saini, who made a flex sensor robotic hand. And you can see that he combined code and also uh, the, compo the electronic components to, to make his prototype. And I have a YouTube video for him linked into this, uh, this part or this uh, slideshow. So when you are thinking of a design for manufacture, Prototype, you're really thinking about how you can move make into the design. You're thinking about, you know, in addition even to what you're 3D designing, if you're in the 3D editor, you're uh, also thinking about what are the outside components that you might need. And also even thinking about things like switches that you might need to incorporate into your design and how you can fit that into the 3D model. You might think about cost as well and where you're sourcing those supplies. You might even think about how your students uh, might market their ideas. As you can see in this example uh, from Draker DG Robotics, and you can find more about Draker in the slideshow. Uh, Draker has designed this robot in Tinkercad, but then applied materials and textures in light in Fusion 360 in order to create this photorealistic rendering that maybe he could use to market his robot. So before we move on to the next segment, uh, we're wondering how do you inspire students to be inventors? How we, how's it going in the chat, Jenny? Um, I think people are busy answering. <laughs> Anything to share quite yet, but I think people are typing. So we're going to learn tonight from Becky and from Dory about how their students have come up with these incredible imaginative ideas to solve real world problems. Uh, even a small problem can inspire a really uh, imaginative and inventive invention. Uh, we have a couple of responses so far. I think encouraging them to embrace failure. Failure is part of inventing. It's a very mm -hmm. important point. Um, let me see what else we've got here. They need to identify a need and start from there. Mm -hmm. um, we had kids design phone stands and made personalized art to go with the stands. Uh, mine are pretty young, so letting them disassemble something with direction. Reverse engineering is Reverse definitely engineering. part of the invention process. So do yeah. please keep chatting with each other in the chat, and we will continue to bring your voices uh, into uh, this episode. So next, I'm going to talk a little bit just about an instructional resource that could support you to help your students see that anyone can be inventive. And this is a Tinkercad lesson plan that was created by our friends at the Smithsonian Spark Lab. And it is the topic of the lesson is how to invent a device that can move through a pipe. So this lesson inspires rigorous, relevant, and engaging learning through really interesting questions as well, such as how can you use virtual materials to, to design an invention that can move through a pipe? What will your invention do while inside the pipe? Inspect, clean, or repair? How will you make sure that your invention can get through both a straight and curved sections of a pipe? So this is where you can find the lesson. So on Tinkercad, if you go to the Teach page, and then you click on Explore Lesson Plans. You will enter a world of <laughs> lessons that we are continuing to tinker and work upon. Uh, and this is the latest one. So you'll see there's a description there. You'll see that there's a longer overview, the very important rubric as well, learning objectives and also standards. So this one's aligned with ISTE standards and Common Core standards. Again, this is the framework that, uh, that the, all of these lessons uh, that Smithsonian has made uh, lead st students through. So this process that's repeatable. Uh, there's also great resources. So when students are exploring an idea, uh, there's this you know, interesting article from MIT News that they can read about as part of their research phase of inventing. They call it exploring. 
They also encourage sketching. So sketching in 2D and even, you know, in the wealth of resources in the Smithsonian collection, they have found uh, some objects from the collection and also some advice on how to communicate with sketches. So you can inject some history into the lesson as well. So another really cool feature of this lesson is that it links to an actual Tinkercad model that they've created with virtual components. So if you click on the blue button, it will take you into uh, Tinkercad, it'll copy and tinker it automatically. And you can see here, students can kind of play around with this kit of parts for their invention. Sometimes it's hard to start from scratch. <laughs> I know some kids really get anxiety about a blank canvas. So this is not a blank canvas. Uh, so there's also uh, in this try it phase, you can see that there's this great worksheet. So, you know, as students have big ideas, there's the interesting questions that help them refine their ideas that you can see here. Another neat feature of the PDFs is that they are typable too. So you can send them out digitally to students uh, and not have to waste paper and they can type directly into them. So it goes through all those phases. So tweak it, sharing. So really thinking about the importance of communication. Uh, so communicating your ideas and communicating your STEM thinking. And this is the, one of the steps that I really love at the end, which is expand your ideas. So really encouraging students after they've you know, gone through a full iteration and share their idea, how they can still be reflective about the process and really think about how they can extend their thinking and learn from the feedback that they got from sharing their prototype. So we have asked this question before, but I thought that it would be good to ask this again because we're gonna be toiling away this summer on new lessons, our lesson plans. So which topics would you like to see us cover in new lesson plans? For the sake of time, let's just do this in the chat uh, and share ideas with each other uh, so that we can move next. I'm just too excited to hear from Dory uh, in her presentation about how she uh, uses Microbit in order to elevate student voice in her classroom and really engage students in seeing themselves in STEM. Dory, take it away. All right, let me see if I can figure out how to share my screen. I bet you can do it. I don't know <laughs> if you're right. pushing I you, you're you're right. Here push I go. past your comfort zone. You right. did it. I did, yay. <laughs> yay. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'd like to thank Tinkercad for inviting me to be a presenter today. And I'd like to also like to thank all of you for being here to learn with us. I am so excited to share with you my experience using the new Microbit Simulator in Tinkercad. As a collaborative educator, I get to collaborate with students and teachers to leverage a maker mindset into all kinds of hands-on activities and project-based lessons. For me, and I'm sure for many of the educators out there today, the introduction of the microbit in the Tinkercad simulator, uh, the simulator of microbit in Tinkercad has been a game changer. Let's take a quick look though at the hardware before we start uh, with the simulator. So I have a screenshot here of the two different microbits that you can uh, get. And just so you know, the simulator in Tinkercad is based on the version one of uh, the microbit. In case you didn't know, the microbit was designed by the BBC and released in the United Kingdom in 2015, and every student got a microbit. In 2020, my school decided to provide a microbit to every student in grades five through eight, which has been absolutely incredible. With such a versatile, res versatile resource, we've been able to integrate this awesome tech tool into our project-based curricula, which I'll share more with you about later in this presentation. Here's a list of all the inputs and outputs you have access to with the microbit, just to give you an idea of what might be available as you get started playing in the simulator. With the introduction of the new microbit simulator in Tinkercad, the idea that any student with access to the internet and a computer or Chromebook can use this tool right away for prototyping or working on proof of concept for various project ideas is incredible. There is literally something for everyone and endless opportunities. 
With that in mind, let me share with you an approach I use with my students when I introduce something new, like the micro bit. The approach is tinker, make, and innovate. I use this approach because it inspires creativity and allows my students to practice their skill building and design thinking at their own pace. The opportunity for differentiating among all the various skill levels you might have in one class is amazing. There's a low floor, high ceiling impact, which leaves everyone inspired and feeling like a rock star creator. So let's get started. I'm gonna switch over to just show you quickly how you can access it, first of all. There is a circuits section in Tinkercad and you can click on create new circuit. I've already got some tabs set up here and we're gonna start with Tinker. The Tinker mindset is an opportunity for you to allow your students to explore a new tool just by sort of looking around at the interface and the library of options. When I do that here, I notice, and I'm excited to notice that there's a micro bit here in the library. In fact, there's an incredible toolbox of options and components here for things that students can tinker around with. What I like to inspire my students to do is just do a quick observation where they might notice that there are those LEDs on the screen and a couple of buttons. They're probably gonna notice that, that gold bar at the bottom with numbers. They're probably not gonna know what that's for though. So part of tinkering around is to see what they can figure out on their own. Uh, they have a code section here where they give you already, as soon as you open it, it on start shows you that you can put a block in there to show a smiley face. And maybe what we'll do is program quickly the A button here, just to show you how this is gonna work. And maybe what we can do is show a number, probably something a little bit more interesting than a zero. So we'll go into math and grab a random number and put that in the same spot here. And instead of picking a random number from one to 10, let's pick a random number from one to six. Maybe we could simulate a die. You can start your simulation to test out your code. And we noticed right away, it gave us that smiley face. And if we press button A, we should get a random number, which we do. I'm gonna try it again just to make sure. And I got us another random number. Pretty cool. I like to give my students at least 20 or more minutes to tinker around with a new tool and then bring them in and have them share with each other what they've learned. That way they're like growing their own library of knowledge by teaching each other. After they've learned a bit about the tool, it's time to move into the make phase where we wonder what can we make with all this new knowledge that we have? And to save time, I already went ahead and made a game. And let's see if you look at my code, if you can figure out what I made. I'm gonna start my simulator and we see it flashing RPS because I made a rock, paper, scissors game. Instead of using the buttons to generate the rock, paper, or scissor icon, I used a different input down here to shake. I'm gonna click on that and it shows me a pair of scissors. I'll shake it again to see what the computer gets and it got a piece of paper. So I won that round and I'm gonna be player A. So I'm gonna press player A to uh, get my score. Get a check mark just to let me know that the computer knows that I pressed button A. Let's play again, shake, paper, shake, paper again, rock. All right, I won again. So I'm gonna get another point. And we'll play one more time. Shake, paper, and shake, scissors. So uh, B wins that time, I'll press B. And I've programmed this so that when I press A and B, it's gonna tell me my score and I got two points. So that's a fun activity to work with your students so that they can make something using the micro bit and a little bit learning a little bit more code. And another idea I have to share with you is maybe to give them a prompt to see if they can figure out how to make a stoplight on their own with a red, yellow, and green LED. Once you've had a chance to tinker and make, it's time to move into the innovate phase where uh, I like to inspire my students to solve real world problems. One place I like to show them to start is in this menu here. There's an option called micro bit where they've provided a bunch of pre-made circuits. 
I'm going to drag one of these out to show you how fun it is to reverse engineer these cool circuits that they give you. I also use this as an opportunity to learn because I can see how they've wired everything up. So I may now realize how to use these pins down here and how to wire things up to those. So this circuit includes a motion sensor and a piezo buzzer. And I am careful to notice how they've wired that up because what I really want to do is reinvent this into something of my own. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that motion sensor, go back into my components and take, a, take an ultrasonic sensor instead. Because instead of detecting motion, I'd rather have it notice whether something is too close to me. And I'm going to go ahead and wire this up and notice that there's all these different cool types of wires you can use. They've recently added these. Um, so you can use an alligator clip or a normal wire and a couple of different choices here. And I'm just gonna use a normal wire. I'm gonna click and drag and click again and bring this over and attach it to ground. And then I'm gonna go ahead and grab my power and drag that over and attach it to the power. And I can change the color of the wire, although it's not really meaningful other than a visual representation for you. And so I try to remind kids that it doesn't really matter what color the wires are so that they're not really stuck on needing a black or needing a red when they get to really building the physical model. I'm gonna attach my signal to pin zero, change the color of that. And you can see how easy it is to uh, recreate a model. I forgot to show you the code, by the way, that they give you over here. That also is a really great learning opportunity to see how they program the various circuits that they build. What's interesting about this prototype right here is I actually had a student who, um, who was able to do that and then actually use that as her proof of concept and build the physical mask as part of our invention class this year. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture that has the ultrasonic sensor in it, but I think you get the idea where you can see here that she uh, used a sewing machine to make her mask and she started wiring up her micro bit with the speaker and the power and all. And she really did an amazing job designing a social distancing mask that was quite effective. And she was so proud of her work when she was done. Another example of student work is from a project-based lear project learning unit from our first semester when our students used Microbit to create a real world problem, uh, to, to create a solution, I mean, to a real world problem. This student used Tinkercad to, pro uh, to prototype a design of a mask that would protect him from breathing in dust during a dust storm. You can see that he used Tinkercad to build his model and then he built it with all the physical materials at home and integrated the micro bit into his mask as part of his innovation. I have one more exa student example for you. And this student also used micro bit to solve a real world problem. And this is part of a solution to a hurricane warning system. He used a servo and a speaker along with the LEDs on his micro bit. And let me show you what he made. I'm gonna try to get over and click on play. Let's see how this goes. It's my final project. And if I want the levy system to go down, I can press A. And as you can see, there's like, it says hurricane. It came. Uh, warning. All right, so you get the idea. He also had sound for that, but the speaker unfortunately broke. And so he just simulated that using another tool called Make Code, which is complementary to the Tinkercad, Tinkercad circuit simulator. As a teacher, I also love to tinker, make, and innovate. So I want to show you something. Let's see if I can get to it. How can I do this? Okay, here comes this one. 
So recently I played pachinko with my father. And if you're not familiar with what pachinko is, it's a mechanical game that's popular in Japan. Take a look at this video and see what you notice that might be relevant to this presentation. Type in the chat things that you see that could be recreated using a micro bit. All right, what I notice is a lot of electronics and flashing sound effects and animated matrix of LEDs that remind me a lot of the micro bit. So after playing this game, it got me thinking, how fun would it be to make my own pachinko game? And then of course, remembering about this webinar, I was wondering maybe we could all try to make a pachinko game as we reflect back on this webinar in an effort to try to tinker, make and innovate ourselves. So, um, oops, let me just stop that real quick. Sorry about that. Don't worry, Dory, it's, I could watch this video forever. <laughs> it's mesmerizing, it's relaxing. So I wanna leave you with a design challenge to tinker, make, and innovate this summer while you think back to this webinar. Could you design and build an interactive pachinko game that integrates Microbit, Arduino, or any other technology that you might want to explore as you imagine how you might integrate a maker mindset and innovation into your own classroom? We created a hashtag, Pachinko Tinkercad, that if in fact you do like to want to design something, you can share with us what you're working on so that we can all continue to learn from each other. Something that I did just because I got started on this already was I made a prototype using Tinkercad that I'd like to show you. And we've made this public. So you can uh, search for Pachinko machine prototype and you can tinker this and either reinvent this, use it exactly as it is, or just learn from the opportunity that I've shared here where there's all these great components in Tinkercad that allow you to design and create amazing prototypes. The next step for me is actually gonna be to build this and to really start to tinker around with the micro bit and see how I can get that to work with my, um, my own Pachinko machine. And I do hope that you will also try to make something and share it out with us using that hashtag Pachinko Tinkercad. And here are some resources for you to explore when you have time. And um, I'm just gonna say thank you to everybody and I'm honored to share the screen today with all these amazing people from Tinkercad. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dory. Your students are so lucky to have you and it's been a delight to learn from you. And there is a slide that Dory has with resources and links and we are gonna share the slides with you in a follow-up email. So uh, I'm going to usurp the screen now. All right, so next up, so we had a quick question for you before we uh, begin uh, with Becky's presentation. So we're wondering, what is your plan for summer learning? And we know that it's been a rough year for a lot of us. So maybe your plan is to how to integrate naps into your life more frequently. Uh, but if there are any professional development opportunities that you're excited about this summer, or you know, maybe even if there are some professional development opportunities that we could create for you this summer, please let us know. So uh, what is your plan for summer learning or what are some things that you might wanna learn this summer aside from making the best pachinko machine ever? So please let us know in the chat. So we're gonna move next to Becky uh, and Becky is gonna talk a little bit to us about uh, innovative work and inventive work that she's done with her students and also within the context of Arduino within Tinkercad circuits. So take it away, Becky. Hello everyone, thanks for having me. Uh, amazing presentation, Dory, thank you for that. I'm here to follow up 
and give you more information about Arduino, which is the other uh, microcontroller we have in Tinkercad circuits. There'll be a lot of similarities and some differences as well. Um, who am I? I am a product manager at Instructables, which is also part of Autodesk, like Tinkercad is. Um, and I'm also an author of Arduino-related things. I wrote this book about this Arduino-compatible um, board called the Flora and um, generally like to publish uh, DIY projects for um, people who want to get into DIY electronics, uh, including students and beginners. But I'm also a part-time faculty member at School of Visual Arts where I teach in an MFA program called um, Products of Design. These are my students from 2019 on the left and uh, 2020 on the right. So we were, we were usually in person, we were all digital last year. And um, although uh, many of you may be uh, teachers for K-12, like younger students, um, I uh, can draw a lot of parallels. Learning, learning basic electronics uh, is very similar whether you're 21 or 13. So uh, <laughs> uh, I uh, will hope to try to convince you of that uh, with my presentation. Um, so what is Arduino then even? Well, Dory already showed you what, uh, what the micro bit is, which is also a microcontroller. It's, uh, a, both of these are platforms for electronic prototyping. Arduino specifically was invented in 2005 at a uh, art graduate program in, in Italy where the professors and the students were trying to make a platform that made it easier for artists to put electronics into their work, artists and designers. So specifically trying to make it easier for creative people. And this is the platform they came up with. Um, it uh, refers to the trademark and the programming language and the physical hardware. So like everything is all layers down are called Arduino. You program it with Arduino to your Arduino board. Um, <laughs> and uh, unlike Microvid, which you program with blocks and Python and JavaScript. And, um, it's really just all of these. Uh, so because it's open source, um, which means that the creators published all the design files and under a license that allowed for creative re-release of those files, you see a lot of uh, Arduino compatible boards out in the market uh, designed specially for uh, purposes that the original learning board couldn't do. So the original board here, the Arduino Uno now is the one you'd get. This shape has been the same since 2005. It's great for plugging wires into because it has these um, these headers here. Uh, it has like big lettering so you can read it. Everything's really accessible uh, on your desk. It's not built to be like small or, uh, or do anything extra, but uh, people have taken the Arduino design and they've developed their own boards. Like this one uh, here is a, got a Bluetooth radio on it so it can uh, talk to your mobile device or your computer. This one here has um, has touch sensitive pads, so it's got uh, some hardware built at, at added onto it to make it uh, be able to take in uh, touch sensing on these pads here, and then also has an SD card and some hardware for playing back um, audio files. So this board is an, a, like a souped up Arduino that can play audio files when you touch different pads on it. Um, and then they, you also see ones that are designed to be uh, sewn into clothing. This one's round, so it doesn't poke you, and has big pads to be sewn with conductive thread. So People take the Arduino idea, they run with it, they make their own version, they sell it, that's allowed. And um, it's led to all of this great innovation over the last uh, 15, 15 years, wow. Uh, so why you would wanna use Arduino, I think the main reason compared to the micro bit is that the, that the community is a little bit older and has more libraries, tutorials and, and people knowledgeable in the forums to be able to help you. Although the micro bit community is huge and really helpful. So I don't know that it's really like a, it's six and one half a dozen the other. Uh, it is easy to get started compared to what we used to use instead of um, instead of this stuff. It used to be you had to have this big big piece of hardware to even program the chip. That, that was expensive and proprietary. And then you also had to pay for proprietary software. So the fact that like all these things are free and um, the board itself is like under $500 is kind of like an amazing revelation in the last 15 years. Um, and these are some these are some LED projects you can make with Arduino. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of a demonstration. On the Tinkercad website, you'll find uh, a bunch of uh, lessons about Arduino. Uh, so if you go to the learn section and you navigate to the circuits area, um, if you go over to projects here, that's where you'll find the Arduino section, but also there'll be a link in the slides for this webinar. So you can get straight to this collection of, uh, of Arduino lessons. And 
What's cool about the lessons on Tinkercad, uh, not to be confused with the lesson plans, we know we have um, some work to do on unifying our learning materials, but these lessons that go with the, um, the, with the Arduino here, they load with the lesson in the panel on the left and uh, the editor here on the right and uh, with a sample circuit that does already what the, um, what the lesson is asking you to do. So you can follow along, basically build um, another, uh, the lesson will ask you to basically duplicate the circuit. So if I, ooh, whoa, using my, what happened? Oh, I, I used my um, magic trackpad and things got a little wonky. Um, they're asking you to like drag right next to it. So oh, my window is a funny size. Maybe it's because I'm sharing. Kellyanne's like, don't do it live. <laughs> Play You're doing great, Becky. <laughs> um, so when you, uh, but it's okay, I have the circuit here. Uh, so th those lessons are great and I'll revisit them in a little bit, but th I have the circuit for this temperature sensor that I wanted to show you. So the lesson, that lesson will teach you how to build this circuit, um, which uses blocks code. What's cool about both environments for microbit and uh, Arduino is that you can look at it as just blocks, but you can also look at it as blocks plus text so that you can, um, uh, if, you're, if your students are of the age where you want to be teaching them uh, the actual code code, you can do that in tandem. So I often start my grad students off with these lessons that where you can look at both because they, their biggest, as design students, they're not engineers, the, uh, the biggest apprehension they have is about how scary this looks. So when they can uh, correlate the, these blocks to exactly what lines of code, it makes it a lot easier to launch them into just building um, code straight code projects themselves later on. The, the, the ramp maybe for my students is a little steeper, but the fact that you can see both is a huge, um, is a huge boon. So um, now that I've shown you that, let's see what this, what does this circuit even do, right? Uh, so you can see that we have all these um, components. Un unlike the micro bit, Arduino doesn't have any sensors built into it. You have to hook everything up. So in that way, I tell people that like, although in the, the blocks code is gonna be the same level of difficulty um, and so therefore maybe virtually they might be exactly the same. If you had students in a room, I think that the micro bit goes a little younger, like you could start a little earlier because they don't have to um, have the dexterity to plug wires into exactly the right holes on the breadboard to actually make something work with the code blocks. Um, but Arduino is geared more towards the hardware anyway. So you can see that now my simulation started um, and I have this temperature sensor here. And when I click on it, I get a little interaction. Uh, I get to change the temperature myself. And uh, this circuit is a bar graph, basically. It'll, sh it'll light up um, one LED based on every, I don't remember, it's like 20 degrees or so. Uh, and then show you, on the, um, show you on the LED readout there how warm or hot it is. So it's like a, it's a very low um, fidelity thermometer with the three LEDs here, but, but the code that it teaches is how to do a thresholding, right? So if it's above the baseline, then it's something. If it's between these two thresholds, it's something else. If it's, so you learn this like if, you can learn your if statements here and uh, conditional reactions to a sensor. Uh, so this lesson, let's see, we'll, we'll go here again and I'll show you how the, yes the lesson kind of goes along with it. So when you're teaching, you can, um, you can have this view up on the board and, and keep your place. There's also occasionally we'll have like a, a, an animated GIF or like this kind of thing where you can pull this up on the screen and leave it while the students copy their own blocks um, onto the, the one that they put here. And then when they're, uh, when they're done or not even when they're finished. Once they've started one of these lessons, you can find your lessons here in your lessons um, area of your Tinkercad dashboard. So you can go back and continue the lessons um, at any time and keep track of your progress that way. So, um, okay, I'm gonna, oh, one more thing I wanted to show you. Dory mentioned the starters. We also have some starters for Arduino here. So um, you, can, you can find a bunch of uh, sample circuits for, just look at that, a bevy of different uh, components you might want to try. And like Dory said, they have, they have code attached to them so you can see what they're doing and, and very well use these in your, in your class and um, have your students drag them out and explore what they do uh, to get a hang of the, their very first time using this uh, platform. Um, okay, so I'm going to share some student work. Um, last semester, 
my student Chi Ting made this uh, water ripple effect lamp. And um, I'm gonna show you her circuit and her instructable that she made. She has a little video of how it works. It might be a little choppy for you, but basically the, um, the idea is that there's a touch sensor in the middle of the lamp and uh, some LED rings and, a, and some LED strip to create the different um, loops. And then when it touches, when, when the sensor is triggered, the, um, the LEDs light up in a certain pattern. And so part of her project was to figure out, uh, okay, I designed this pattern. Um, how do I make this pattern that she designed the pattern in like, I don't know if it was After Effects or Illustrator. Here's her like sketch. She made this sketch as a like, here's part of my proposal. This is what I want my lamp to do. So she used whatever software she had access to, to create this mock-up to help communicate what she wanted to do with code. And then we were able to work together on the circuit to, um, to collaborate. So, so half of my class last, uh, last semester was in China. So we had not only a time difference, but also like a, um, a barrier in uh, uh, shopping for parts. So um, oh, now that I'm screen sharing, it's like acting all funny, of course. And so we use Tinkercad circuits to, to lob ideas back and forth. When normally I could write, a, draw this circuit on a piece of paper in front of them in the classroom, this is much, much better because uh, there's no ambiguity. And the reason there's no ambiguity is I can have them send, I can say, okay, send me a sketch of your circuit. And uh, if it works, it works, right? If it doesn't work, there's no faking it. They can't show me a diagram and say, oh, this is my diagram and here's a video and they're not quite the same thing. Um, this really makes it like a one for one. Uh, this is the code that runs on this circuit. And that that's kind of gets them over a big um, milestone in the, the link between the hardware and the software. So you can see here, I'm using a button instead of the touch sensor. Um, not all sensors are supported in here in circuits. You, you have a pretty basic uh, arrangement of, of inputs, push button potentiometer. Um, but because the sensor she was using generates a digital signal that basically is just like a button. And on the Tinkercad site, you'll find uh, a guide to other sensor substitutions like that, in case you're teaching with a particular piece of hardware Tinkercad doesn't have, you can often find just uh, a simple, um, simple alternative that acts like it in the simulation um, and provides you that easy uh, way to get it through. So you can see how the LEDs are animating in the same fashion as they were on her lamp, except they're in more diagram form here because these are the rings and then here's the strip that she actually had curved in her project. Um, so that's one student work example. I put links to all of the um, to all of the work here, so like the instructable and the Tinkercad circuit, so you can check it out yourself in more detail. Um, here's another student work by uh, my student Susan. She had a problem with her roommate's cat coming into her room and peeing on her bed, so she made this device to detect. Uh, uses that ultrasonic distance sensor Dory was talking about that detects the distance of the object in front of it and then has a piezo buzzer to make a sound when there's something in front of the sensor and she put it in this funny little cat. This is just like a piece of cardboard she used to sort of set up the, the sensor. So um, the circuit for that uh, is actually based on the um, this one that we just looked at, this temperature sensor LED bar graph. Her project used this uh, example from the lesson, and just like Dory showed you how to swap out the sensor, this one uses the, the um, distance sensor instead of the temperature sensor, but basically the same thing with the LEDs. Um, so I'll show you how that works with the simulation here. Uh, the sensor here, when you click on it, it gives you like a, um, it gives you a range, uh, a little like reticle to, uh, this is like the cat, and then as it gets closer, um, when it goes too close, it makes a sound from the piezo buzzer. And we can also see the um, input coming in from the serial monitor here to keep track of uh, like what the distance is um, to be sure that it's working. So that's a really fun one. Um, let's see. You can see this one, she made it in just no blocks code. This one is just made in regular Arduino because um, they were building physical prototypes of their stuff as well. Um, so similarly, uh, Susan also has an instructable for her project. That's what they had to make for their final projects was a, an, an instructable to teach people how they made. So you can go watch, she has a little video too. You can go through her design process um, of what she did for, uh, for branding her, um, her prototype product. Um, okay, so uh, in summation, 
Um, there are these resources that you could use to learn Arduino um, and to teach Arduino with your students. The first big one is the, the lessons on, um, on tinkercad.com slash learn that I showed you earlier. Uh, this learn Arduino section has uh, this many delicious uh, beginner Arduino lessons that uh, were written by me. So I can prove to you that they're good. Or, you know, I can endorse them, tell you that they're good um, for, <laughs> for teaching with your, with, for teaching yourself and for teaching your students. And then um, those same lessons also exist on Instructables if, if that's your platform of choice or you, or you wanna send links around to them that way. Um, they're here and it's the same content, but the videos are embedded. Each one of these does have a video lesson that goes along with it. And if you wanna watch just the videos, there is a, uh, a playlist of them and you can listen to more of me talking just like this over these six lessons of <laughs> intro to Arduino. So we really do have that quite well covered um, on the Tinkercad Learn site. Kellyanne's gonna show you later that we do have some similar micro bit content coming very soon. So you can expect to see some, some cool lessons that with the um, that immersive experience for micro bit coming soon too. Um, and then I guess I could also plug for you my Arduino class on Instructables that we made before um, the Tinkercad lessons is more of a hands-on approach that does have embedded circuit and does have Tinkercad circuits embedded throughout, but goes into more detail about the physical, um, the physical parts that you uh, would need to give to your students to, um, to build up your circuits in a, using the physical components too. Um, so thanks for having me and um, I look forward to answering any questions you might have after Thank at the you. end of the presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Becky. I always learn so much from you. For example, I learned the word reticle tonight, so I'm excited to integrate that into my everyday vocabulary. You also left me with a sense of wonder about what sound is scariest to cats. So that's something <laughs> that I might go off and research. So thank you so much, Becky. And also really cool to see how college students are also using Tinkercad to learn electronics, particularly in a distance learning environment. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Uh, we probably, yes, yeah, so we have another question for you, but this is an easy one. You can just raise your hand. So raise your hand if you have ever used Arduino or Microbit with your students. Seen a lot of hands raised. So I'm going to give you some time to do that. It's very exciting to see on this end as well. And Jenny is really good at mental math. So Jenny, <laughs> what's, what's the percentage? <laughs> um, well, I would say, hold on, it's, it's still building here. Um, well, you can entirely make up. Under number. half for sure. <laughs> 40%. <laughs> under half. Well, we hope that that number increases after this webinar as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, at this point, I'm actually going to hand it over to Daria, uh, who is going to uh, share a poll with you. Absolutely. And um, the point of the poll is to make sure that what we're doing is also helpful for you um, as teachers attending the webinar. So the first question is just on a scale of five to one, how useful was this webinar for you? Um, and the second question is how long have you been teaching with Tinkercad? So your responses will help us inform future topics, the level of detail, whether it should be beginner, advanced, somewhere in the middle. Um, and then lastly, if you have any suggestions for what you'd like to see in future webinars, please feel free to pop them into the chat um, and we will have a record of those internally to reference for future webinar planning. Um, I do wanna share a small celebration while the floor is over here, um, which is that this is actually our best attended webinar for the entire year. So thank you to all the educators who attended this evening um, slash morning slash wherever you are for helping us finish the year strong. We were actually concerned internally, would we lose teachers because we understand it's after the April spring break or Easter break. So um, the turnout has been incredible and we're so excited that everyone's excited to teach with Arduino, with Microbit, um, and here we have to share. Thank you so much, Daria. It is really exciting not only to see how many people are here tonight, but also just how engaged they are in the chat and how supportive they are of each other. So if you're just joining tonight too, you have really joined a very welcoming Tinkercad teacher community. So we hope that you stick with us. All right, so, so this is the announcement that um, that Becky uh, wanted me to share. Is it is it a starter or are they lessons that are coming out? So coming soon. They're lessons. The starters inside the app uh, already exist. Dory showed them to you, but we're getting some, some lessons where the lesson panel shows up on the left and the editor on the right for you to like work along with the lessons. Sweet. Thank you, Becky. So this is coming soon. I may have seen some of them already and I'm excited about it. <laughs> so they, they are real and they are coming. 
Uh, we also wanted to let you know that uh, next month, because we're still in April, uh, is Scratch Week. Uh, so we will be uh, sharing with you some act fun activities that you can do through Instructables and Tinkercad uh, so that you can participate in the themes for Scratch Week this year. So do please stay tuned for that. That's May 17th to May 23rd. And we're really excited to celebrate Scratch Week with our friends at Scratch. Also just wanted to, to put the word out about a contest for students. Uh, it's called Make It Big. If you go to autodesk.com slash autodesk make it real, uh, it's a, a webinar series and also design challenge that we are hosting in collaboration with football star and innovative de designer, James Devlin. Uh, so please, uh, if your students are particularly interested in the architecture, engineering, and construction industry, please have them check out the latest challenge uh, and also to check out the work by previous winners. So there's a lot of great student work uh, involved in this contest too. And do please stay connected. Again, this is our last webinar for this school year, um, but we do hope that you stay connected, again, using the hashtags Tinker Together or hashtag Make Anything. Uh, you can also reach out to us at all of these links. So the Tinkercad forum, uh, you can get your, the most trusted news source of the Tinkercad blog. Uh, please uh, follow us on Twitter, Instagram. Uh, and if you wanna email us, you can uh, reach out to us at tinkercadlearning at autodesk.com. If this is, if you're just joining or maybe you haven't seen uh, all the episodes of this webinar series, you can find them at the Autodesk Tinkercad YouTube channel. There's a playlist, you can see it in the lower left right there. And if you click on it, uh, you can see all the episodes from the series. We also just wanna make sure that we uh, celebrate your work with us this year and your participation. Uh, we think that you deserve the world, but right now we can give you this certificate and this will be emailed with you, emailed to you in the follow-up email. So maybe if you're using this webinar series as part of your professional development plan, you can use this as evidence uh, of your learning. And we hope you learned a lot tonight. We also don't want you to forget about our fun challenge from uh, Dory. So this could be like a fun summertime challenge as well. Uh, hashtag Pachinko Tinkercad. Again, Dory has shared the link to her design. So maybe you could remix what she's done or come up with your own uh, invention. Uh, but we also hope that you uh, enjoy your summer. Uh, we know that there's you know a little bit more of the school year left to go this year. Uh, we hope that you celebrate however you want to celebrate this summer, and we hope that you uh, still uh, stay connected with us. Uh, and please, we would love to see your Pachinko machines. So hashtag Pachinko Tinkercad. So uh, Daria asked you this before, but you know, please do let us know in the chat uh, what topics you would like for us to cover in an upcoming webinar, or you know, an upcoming you know some type of professional development experience. So that is the end of the formal presentation. However, we are going to stop sharing my screen and we're gonna be Brady Bunch. Uh, and we're here for your question and answer. I actually think this summer I might write a book called We Are in a Webinar and I'm gonna include all of you as characters, including Josh who's with us tonight as well. He's a developer on the Tinkercad team. So welcome Josh. So Jenny, how are we doing for questions? Yeah, we do have a couple questions. It looks like Becky's been answering a few, but um, do you have any final project suggestions that my grade 12 students can, you, can do using Arduino in a virtual environment? Final project suggestions, grade 12. That's old enough to ask them to solve a problem in their everyday life, right? But I, I, as a design professor, I, I, like that's my jam. My designers come to me and they're like, I have all these ideas. And I'm like, Ooh, that one, pick that one. <laughs> uh, and the assignments are open-ended. So um, uh, I, let's see. Yeah, I, I think they should solve a problem in their real life. Great. <laughs> um, we had a question about, will Tinkercad update to the V2 micro bit? That's a good one for Joshua. Yeah, so uh, we, we've talked about that. We, we've actually uh, work, been working with uh, the Microbit organization uh, a bit. So we're, we're actually planning on doing that. I uh, don't know a timeline yet, but we, we are planning to do that. Great, thank you. Um, another question, can we simulate the physical design in design with electronics part in circuit, in circuits? Any possibility to integrate those two parts? 
physical design. So in the 3D editor in Tinkercad, if you go under the drop down for the shapes panel, there is a section of circuits components. So when you are designing like a robot chassis, you can pull out a physical shape of an Arduino board, the physical shape of an LED, the physical shape of a servo motor, and then design your enclosure or your chassis around it. Um, it doesn't quite, you can't like hit play in the 3D editor the same way you can in the circuits for making the circuit actually do something, but you can get to a place where you're using Tinkercad on both the circuit side and the, um, the 3D side. Likewise, there's also, like circuits, there's a thing called a circuit assembly, which is like a 3D shape that's designed to, there's a, there's a couple of them. One is like designed to hold an LED and a coin cell battery. And so it's a way for you to uh, easily in the 3D editor, drag out a thing that you know is going to work with the real life components because it's locked to the right size. I was gonna say, that's what I did with the Pachinko. I went into that component section and I grabbed a micro bit and I grabbed some LEDs and things like that, so. Someone has a question about, for Becky, are you the amazing cosplay pro on Adafruit? <laughs> uh, I, before I worked at Autodesk, I did, I was the director of wearable electronics at Adafruit, yes. Uh -huh. But I've been working at Autodesk for longer than I worked at Adafruit. Yeah. <laughs> all, all maker superheroes like you have like that, stories that are I do have hundreds of projects in my name many of them wearables yes mm -hmm. uh, when working with students in Tinkercad virtually is there a way I can see what they're doing in real time I'd like oh, to take yeah you can invite them to collaborate on your um on your circuit so um if I were to should I shop hop in and share my screen or is that a sufficient enough answer you hit the like invite button and then you send them a link and then they hop in and then you're working together yeah, there's a collaboration link you can create within the editor where you can share that with them and both have it open at the same time and, and see uh, both working. You can see kind of like a ghost working alongside of you there. So I do that we when I'm working. Episode with... one, Jenny and I did a demonstration of that with That's right. a character yeah. called Pumpkina. It's very cool for remote um, when you can just hop into a student's circuit and show them some stuff and then hop out. Uh, but I've used both, like hopping in to do it at the same time, but it's also useful to iterate um, so you can see the different versions and stuff. I use the classroom feature in Tinkercad and I can, as a result, see what all my students are doing in real time. There you go. Uh, is there a way to request a part to be included in the circuit section of Tinkercad? Yes, you can write in on the, on the Tinkercad service. Is that right, Christian? Is that where we were sending people for the, to request a part? Yeah, yeah, there's, um, there's, you can, you can, there's a, at the bottom of tinkercad.com, there's a help center link and you can open a ticket there where um, we get a lot of requests. So we're definitely, we've actually just formed a way to sort of uh, uh, gather all these requests and, and sort of weigh them all out. So um, we do try to keep the list of components lean so that everything's working together and, and uh, you know, it's, it's an inviting environment for beginning uh, beginning to build circuits so additionally I'd like to point out um, that if you're if you're new to uh, the Tinkercad circuits um, you might look at the list of components here and you don't see that there's a there's a bunch um, we actually have uh, there's a drop down menu at the top of the components panel panel uh, where by default we just show the basic components but then there's a there you can select all which it gives you a significantly more uh, more components. Thank you for showing. <laughs> yes, and they're they're arranged by category. And then I also made a guide for sub sensor substitutions. So, yes, and to your question, we take we take requests, we concatenate them to look for the most common requests, and we try to keep our components lean and offer you alternatives for uh, things we we don't plan to add. <laughs> Okay, we have a couple other questions. Is there any planning to design Tinkercad platform offline? Sorry. Christian, you're muted. I like to talk when I'm muted. Uh, there, at the moment, um, there's, there's discussions for having it work offline. For example, if the internet is jammed, if you're, you have 50 students all trying to use the same router, for example, you know, we'd want to have continue to have a good experience there. Uh, I, um, there's talks about that, not in the near term, but um, we are talking about solutions for um, enabling Tinkercad in the editors to work while the internet connection may be off or busy, for example. 
We have a question for Dory. Um, thank you for all the examples. How does the micro bit work with the mask in reality? Well, it was a prototype of an invention idea she had. And so she's got it all embedded into that mask. And the idea is that if somebody gets too close, then an alarm goes off to alert her and the person too close that they're too close. Um, another comment, I'm having trouble thinking of a way to use Tinkercad, Microbit and or Arduino when teaching geometry, such as triangle congruence and constructions. Any ideas? <laughs> Hmm. Geometry, triangle congruence, and constructions using Tinkercad. Microbit. For the Jeopardy music. <laughs> yeah. Well, there is a built-in compass uh, uh, with uh, for the microbit. So um, you could potentially use the microbit to measure angles. So that is one thing. <laughs> and the 3D editor, there could be some creative. You know, some of the teachers we've talked to have created some of their own lessons and they have these public lessons in their own dashboard that they share with their students, for example, you know, intersecting a cube with a cylinder to show, you know, uh, how, what the intersection uh, shows and, and how that can create uh, uh, form like trig functions, for example. So there's, there's ways to do it. Um, there's some creative ways to do it. I don't think we have any particular ones for that type of lesson in our lesson um, repertoire, but. Uh, well, I'm thinking of all of the, the graphic stuff you can do with Arduino. So you can plug in, um, just like you have the boards here, they they make these like add-on boards called shields that like plug right on top. And you can get like a shield with like an LCD display. And there's all kinds of uh, math you do for geometry for drawing shapes on the LCD display. Um, so that could be a way to incorporate geometry into, you could draw the try have them draw the triangles with code. Mm -hmm. uh, additionally, it just occurred to me as well that uh, if you wanted to get wanted, to, you know, this isn't necessarily going to be very precise in the real world, but uh, using something like a compass to measure angles or the accelerometer that's built into the micro bit, and then maybe in, in uh, connection with a distance sensor with that um, ultrasonic distance sensor. So, you know, measuring angle and distance to objects. I have another question. I have combined some digital and analog circuits and had trouble with coupling them. Is something like this possible? Uh, absolutely. That's a there's a lot. Question. Yeah. yeah. yeah there's, yes. The, the the short answer. Sorry. Sorry, Becky. Uh, the short answer is absolutely. Uh, that's a that's there's a lot. That's a large part of electronics is is uh, is figuring out how to uh, go back and forth between the analog. Uh, and digital worlds. Uh, and we have components that support that. Um, all of the programmable components all have analog sensors built into them. Uh, so they can measure uh, uh, voltages um, in, a, in an analog fashion, but convert that to a, to a digital numerical number. Um, and that it's, it's fairly easy to also create uh, circuitry that takes a digital input and produces an analog output. Or vice versa. And that is sort of the terminology that the Arduino lessons use to introduce it. There's like inputs and outputs, analog and digital. And so there's, you can do any combination of those, a digital input and analog output, the opposite or digital, digital, analog, analog. I used to have actually a good, um, I need to see if I can find it. And if I, if I do all, I'll, I'll include a link, but um, I had created a discrete circuit that was not, that did not use a programmable device, but um, goes through the process of doing an analog to digital conversion uh, through discrete components. And if I can find that, I'll, I'll send that out. For all you teachers out there, Joshua is an electronics expert who like is leagues and bounds above even, the, like I'm focused on teaching Arduino, but didn't go further into electrical engineering. He's talking about some crazy stuff. But you can do a lot with Tinkercad circuits, building stuff from discrete components too. So although we focused on a lot about the microcontrollers during this webinar, if you wanna go super old school with um, like Charles Platt's old uh, analog circuit designs and stuff, you can, there's a lot of um, low level chips in there too that we didn't really cover tonight that are, they're more like the old school way of learning electronics before microcontrollers were really easily accessible. I have another question. Any plans to integrate the Raspberry Pi Pico? As it becomes more available, it will be very popular in schools. 
Uh, the answer there, the short answer is no. And the, the reason being that um, uh, basically, you know, in our, in our electronic simulator, we are simulating everything that uh, the Arduino can do. And we're, we're simulating basically everything that the, that the micro bit can do. The Raspberry Pi is, would be another level of trying to simulate basically an entire computer in your computer. They're asking about the Pico, Joshua, which is their new oh, microcontroller. So yes, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> th th thanks for that clarification. Uh, we will consider it. Put in a parts request. Yes, when please. we get four, five million parts requests, then, then <laughs> we'll hand over the request to Joshua. OK, another one. Um, I teach the fundamentals of breadboarding and logic using traditional ICs. Will Tinkercad continue to carry these ICs? Yeah, we have got no plans to uh, retire any of the existing components. And um, if there are some, if there are gaps, even in those ICs, um, if there are gaps of like things that, that are just really useful that we just don't have there, we, we still consider those um, as options to add new components. Okay. Uh, will there be a robotic simulation added to TCAD? One, the student, one that allows the students to code a bot to explore its way through a maze, for example. Uh, th that's an interesting question. I, I think that that would be like a really nice end goal for all of the all of the, the for the editors to come together to be able to simulate, you know, to to bring your circuit into the three D editor and actually start to simulate within the three D context. It's it's definitely interesting. It's interesting to all of us I hear at Tinkercad, and um, you know, I think someday maybe we'll get there. Well, probably not next year, but yeah. <laughs> Always open to ideas. Um, is there a plan to add the option to give feedback on students' work in the classroom feature? Can you say that again? Sure. Is there a plan to add the option to give feedback on students' work uh, on the classroom feature? Um, that's a request. That's that's an interesting request. Uh, we, we may do that at some point. Um, there is a, a 3D notes that you can um, that a teacher could put inside of the uh, the editor, both in circuits and in um, and in the three D editor, that could be used for now. Um, there's also comments, though. If the if the if the teacher has safe mode employed for their class, the comments get disabled for the students. So I'd recommend using the three D annotation for that. And then, uh, it would be awesome to have more support on Tinkercad for IoT projects, especially regarding connectivity. Any thoughts? We used to have the um, ESP8266 module, but um, some of the features were causing a, what, a security hole. So we had to, we had to like take out like some core bit of its function to, to meet our security standards. And that sort of made it silly to keep the other one. So we decided to retire the part. Um, there's an article about it on the Knowledge Center that probably puts it a little more tactfully. Mm -hmm. So that so that's a, a little, maybe a low light that um, we used to have more uh, in the history of the product had a little more um, IoT capability. But um, I can tell you that I taught, you saw in my student Susan's work, she wasn't using an Arduino Uno board, she was using a, um, an ESP8266 board. We just use the the code for their projects is largely this largely the same, and the um, for their projects, and they were able. I was able to use the Uno to as a stand-in for the digital version when their physical board was a different board that was an IoT board and had maybe a different pinout. So the, like slightly awkward, but still possible to um, like Susan's circuit shows an Arduino Uno, but she used a Node MCU in her final project. It's okay to like I don't know. Uh, to sort of suspend the disbelief, but they work, they, they're very similar. Is there a way to share a 3D model of mine with a class without publishing it, but leaving it on private? Maybe I haven't found the option. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but we're working on that, so stay tuned. Great. Could they hope, share it, like share the link? What's that? You can share, a public, you, you can share a public URL. Um, you can share a pub, you have to make the design public and then give that link to your students in you know 
email or Google Classroom or something like that. But the question was, how do you do it without making it public? So we're working on that. As well. I just wondered if you could use collaborate, like and share it with this. You could do a collaboration. Yeah. Although that, that, the, student, the students if, might do if, interesting. If you have a collaboration things. link, then the student's going to be editing your direct thing. Yep. It won't be. It won't be <laughs> just tell know, them but, they always follow directions. You can tell them to make a copy of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> they won't sabotage it. I was going to say another workaround you could do for that is uh, exporting an STL and letting them import that, but that's an extra step on their front as well. So I don't know how helpful that would be. Yeah. All right. I think that concludes the list of questions. There were a lot of engagement today. Uh, so thank you very much for the conversation. And Matt, I saw you were very busy in the chat answering questions there as well. So um, yeah. Awesome. Well, we let this run a little bit late tonight. One, because it's our last episode of the year, but two, it just you're still here and you're still engaged in asking questions. So we hope that you continue to stay engaged with us. Uh, we hope that the summer and the palm trees and the beach and your pachinko machine are in your in your sights and your immediate vision. You're almost there. Um, we think the world of you, and we're so happy that you joined us this evening. I just want to also thank uh, Dory. Uh, for being an awesome teacher and maker and always just being someone to share, you know, her work with the world and to share her students' work. And for Becky teaching us tonight uh, about Arduino within Tinkercad, I know I learned a lot. Uh, and also just want to thank the Tinkercad team and the Autodesk education team uh, for being here tonight to answer all the teachers' questions. Uh, so we're going to be signing off for now, uh, but we hope that you stay in touch uh, and we will be in touch with you soon too. All right, so take care. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. We can all do our awkward wave at the end before I end. Thanks for joining. <laughs> Good night, everyone.